Welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the podcast that gives you a peek inside the minds of some truly inspirational teachers. This week, in a very special episode, I'm honoured to welcome none other than Gareth Metcalf onto the podcast to talk about all things primary mathematics. Gareth is a titan of the mathematics education world who needs no introduction, and I have absolutely no doubt that you're going to love this, the final episode of season two. Without further ado, let's spend some time thinking deeply about primary mathematics education. Excellent. So thank you very much, Gareth, for joining us. And I think people will be familiar now that we always start off with um, our guests and numbers just to get a feel for who they are. And so you can answer using numbers. Most people stick to the rules, or or to be fair, most people don't. Um, But the first question is years as a teacher. Uh, 13. Last year group taught? Uh, Year one. Most important year group? Now, I'm cheating a little bit here because my answer is year one, but I wanted to give an honourable mention for year three, four as well. So, so if, I, if I just kind of explain, I think year one is, is a really important year group um, with the kind of teacher navigating this whole idea that building early number sense skills, um, making sure that children can, can subitize, giving them meaningful context for counting, kind of tying that in with the changes uh, in, you know, in introducing the year one curriculum as well. So I think that's a really skilled period. And so I think, and, and again, I think research talks about the importance of uh, the children's early and maths experiences. So I think year one would be my answer. But let me say, I, I did want to mention, that I think that the phase where we introduce written calculation and managing that really skillfully and also see really kind of valuing I guess children's um this combination of children's mental and written strategies that children don't see maths almost as being a fork in the road as being a procedural subject I think is really important so so also that transition I I would say in year three and four is really important but my my short answer is year one Uh, no I'm I'm 100% with you on that and there's a lot of great maths is introduced in year three um, and I really like that how you said, and that's when we introduce written calculation, because I think any earlier than that, um, and, you know, we're, we're taking away the, um, the sort of the, you know, all the great mental processes that, that you can really get into in year two and stuff. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm 100% with you on that. Um, Favourite year group? I think as, as, a, as a teacher, as an experience, uh, I would say year five. Total questions written for the superb I see reasoning and I see problem solving series. And it took me a little bit to to count these up, but it was. So the number of tasks is 2,977. Wow. So I surprised myself a little bit with that one. But yeah, and and so so some of those tasks have multiple questions written in, but that's how many tasks there are now and and ever growing. (laughs) That's phenomenal. Um, And tweets. So I am on, at the time of writing, um, or the time of recording, I should say, 7,797. Um, now, I, I thought I'd add about this one, because I, I, I've listened to most of the previous episodes, and most people say, oh, it's an embarrassingly high number. And actually, for me, I, I would like it to be more, b- bizarrely, but I, I actually personally have found it difficult been online too much late into the evening because I've got this unusual body clock where I kind of I go to sleep pretty early and I wake up really early and I I think it's years of being a dad really and I found that if I was on getting into conversations on Twitter too late then I would I would be going to sleep really late and waking up really early Um, but in the fullness of time I'd I'd actually love for that number to increase and, and to be able to interact more. Yeah, I get you. Sometimes the best conversations seem to start at half past 10. You're like, oh, come on. <laughs> I, just, I need to go to sleep now. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I would be, uh, I, I'm, I'm dead to the world at that time. No good for anything. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get you. <laughs> um, so you're a teacher, mathematics specialist, and as I said, author of the fantastic I See Reasoning and I See Problem Solving series. Tell us about your journey and how you got here. Yeah, so having, um, I did my NQT year, I kind of stumbled through my NQT year down south. um, And then I I got a job at a school um, just outside, just south of Manchester, uh, a school that I I loved. I was there for 12 years, uh, met some amazing people there. Um, And it was kind of in that time, I guess, that maths kind of 
developed into a the maths teaching developed into a passion of mine something that I that I really enjoyed and I guess it, it, to some extent the, the story if you like started when I actually wrote a resource that that was called uh, the maths apprenticeship now it was originally uh, it was a vehicle for doing two things. It was it was trying to really um, give really rich and inspirational experiences to children whose attainment was very high in year six. And it was trying to find a kind of meaningful applications at that time of, of mathematics. And so then we were, children were writing security codes for the MI5 and they were designing stock reordering systems for a fruit stall and designing adventure parks and so on and so forth. Uh, and it was a little bit based on the format of the, the Apprentice, the TV show. So children in teams coming up with these, uh, finding solutions to, to different problems. And it would also buy me time to have more teaching time with children to, to kind of fit certain, um, certain gaps and address misconceptions and so on. Um, and actually, then I, I basically I, I had written that for the um, for a small group of children in my class, and some of the uh, the, the particularly the dep deputy head and the head teacher at the school said we should see if we could take this um, and more widely. So I, I did some work with some schools in the local authority around rolling out that project specifically. Um, I, I also then, through doing that, got um, one of my colleagues put me in touch with Alan Peets, the literacy um, guru, who is an amazing guy. Um, and the kind of the short story, I guess, is that he ended up publishing that resource, uh, or, or I did uh, with, with Alan. And then uh, a few years down the line, I've done a lot of work in schools in Stockport, sporting with maths. I started running Math CPD um, and, and kind of loved that. And but the thing that I think was really interesting and um, where I, I ended up getting into writing the resources is by that time I'd have started posting little bits on, on Twitter and, and, and engaging in that world. And I guess that some of the resources that I'd published had been some of the big back end experiences that children would have where I'd try and really immerse them in what I hope was kind of really engrossing, emotionally engaging maths. But I actually think that most of my success came from a lot of the smaller, little nitty gritty pieces. Um, and we'd been building up uh, this, this kind of approach to teaching maths, um, using a lot of the techniques that I, I didn't have the kind of, I didn't have the background in educational research by then and didn't really understand the basis for them, but it, it just intuitively seemed to make sense. And I always remember writing a blog just about some of the techniques that I would use to vary the challenge that children would have. And I would have not very many people reading the blog. And then all of a sudden, this one blog post that had like 6,000 views in a day, which even now, is, it seems incredible. Um, and, and I thought, well, actually, perhaps this is, the, there is this real appetite. And this has obviously really resonated with people. And I, I also remember doing a training event um, just, uh, just outside of London. And... Um, and I was talking about some of the techniques that I felt like could be used to, uh, to vary the challenge that children have later in the sequence of lessons. And I remember sharing a few examples. There was one, I shared an example of a, a rank by difficulty question. There was another how many ways task. And, and a teacher in, um, kind of came to me and said in a very sensitive and the correct way, Gareth, you know, I really like these ideas, but I'm just never gonna be able to outwork this on a daily basis. Um, it's just not realistic. Um, and actually that was really the inspiration for me to think, right, to, to write the IC reason resources and think, well, how do a lot of these techniques that I've been working on, um, how, how do they, how, how can I make this happen? How can I make this a daily reality? Or, or how can I produce a bank of resources that people can then innovate from? Um, and that, I guess, to some extent was, was where, I guess my work in publishing began really. I'd worked with it in an amazing school with some amazing colleagues and I was very, very re reluctant to leave. But what I wanted to do was broaden my own teaching experience um, because I, I'd realised that I'd been in this one school for 12 years and, you know, two form entry primary. Um, so since then I, I, I looked at, well, how can I teach more maths lessons in a wider variety of contexts um, and understand more about the challenges that, that 
that teachers face, I guess, um, to develop maths pedagogy. So I, I've been doing that for a few years, which I've, I've loved working in uh, northwest of England and in North Wales, uh, kind of teaching from nursery to year six. It's been really eye opening. Um, I, I miss having my one class. Um, and I miss the kind of relational side of that, but but yeah, I, I, I'd say that's that's kind of where I am now. And then and now running IC Maths, but being as connected to classrooms as as I can possibly be, whilst hopefully writing resources that that will be you know that teachers will find really helpful on the ground. I, th I think um, your approach uh, really resonates with them um, with teachers. You know, as you say. Um, you know, you're putting them front and centre, their experience at, this, at the heart of what you're doing, um, and then equally try, making sure you're teaching as much as possible. You know, I think when, we're, when we start out, we, we want to have a lot of experience, but that it, it builds up over time, doesn't it? You know, and, you know, you can't teach all the year groups at the same time. And um, so, I th yeah, because I remember you put out a, a call for people to test out. Um, I think it might have been the start of the IC problem solving Um journey and you know and, and I was like yes that, that you know that's that's the way to design something that's really you know genuinely helpful for teachers is to get them involved and you know you, you know those core principles you've got and I think really make a lot of sense and they also they really shine through as well. Hey, that, that actually is interesting that because that came from reading a book by uh, Matthew Saeed who talked about the importance of failing fast which has been something that, that I think has really resonated with me and so I, what I thought I'd wanted to be able to do is, is share ideas early, see and get as much feedback as possible about what worked, what didn't work. So essentially I could I fail quickly and then and then be able to develop the ideas further and, and um, so they'd be more helpful. So so that that's been my philosophy. I found that feedback really, really useful. Yeah, I mean and it makes a lot of sense. Um I think you know with with the we could sit and design what we think is the perfect six question sequence. But then, but it's only it's once you get that feedback from the kids, you think, oh yes, next time I'm going to do this, and next time I'm going to do that. So like, you know, the kids five years from now who I'm setting challenges for, it, it, they'll be the ones who benefit. You know, you know, a couple of years down the line, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And um, so I think the next question might be a really obvious one. And um, but you're an extremely passionate about high quality mathematics education in primary. And um, but why is the highest standard of maths education essential at our phase of education? Yeah, I think that is a really great question. And that was one that I guess early on in my journey of, of getting into reading research was, was something that was really important for me. I mean, first of all, it was actually just realising that maths is such a pow powerful predictor of, of overall long-term academic success. Um, and when I had that awareness of that, and I remember, again, a, a colleague of mine saying, well, one, Gareth, I think the thing that you can do that that will make the biggest difference to children in the long run is actually just improve their improve their attainment in mathematics and and just that, that awareness that it is really important in the long term and um, but also the idea that there were certain aspects of maths that were more predictive of long-term success than others so looking at for example the, the fact that reasoning is more a more powerful predictor of later mathematics success than arithmetic um and, and I, I think that the kind of the nature of the maths experience that children have, as well as their attainment in maths, is really important in, in terms of building the, the skills and the characteristics that they need, that they need going forward. Um, and I, I think that, like, I, I've always felt like maths is a, is a really interesting subject insofar as in reflecting on yourself as a learner and in growing as a learner, because I think that it puts a, it kind of almost puts a mirror on you in, in how you are as a learner, um, because you get such immediate feedback on your relative success. And I think it's unique like that. And I think everyone's experience of maths is tied into a, an emotional response and, 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 and how, they, how they experience that. And I think it, it's, it's a really powerful tool for, for growing children as learners and, and reflecting on themselves as learners um, and I think it's so easy you know particularly if children don't have the right early number experiences as I'm sure so many people have experienced have this kind of fork in the road uh, in in maths and and that in in terms of you know people's relative success with it um, 
and I think it's really important that that we give children the tools to deal with that but but also I think there's so much richness in maths with the you know the kind of search for the solution that we can have um and that we want as many children to experience and, and to experience positively as as possible um and I think within that it, it's ensuring that children have enough success I think that's something that I, that I hadn't really appreciated earlier on in my career and the importance of children you know experiencing success in maths particularly early in in sequences of lessons or within lessons and and that's something that I guess has always has always resonated with me in, in trying to in trying to build great um, maths or giving children great experiences of mathematics. One, one of the things I've been doing recently is supporting our, our early years colleagues with them, um, you know, because they're moving into uh, a new framework um, in next year. Um, and one of the things we've been looking at is how, no matter how it's presented, the fundamentals of mathematics are the fundamentals of mathematics. And what we prioritise will we'll always remain, you know, what we've always prioritized, you know, like you said, things like supertizing or subitizing, um, you know, the principles of counting, really nailing those. Um, because the impact, you know, having the freedom as I've had the last four years to really only focus on mathematics, looking at that journey from three years old to 11 years old, um, you know, you can really see, or I certainly I've really, I've noticed year on year, um, just how important, like you say, that success early on is, because then you can do the really, the really fun and really beautiful stuff. Because you've got a solid understanding of, of all the things that make maths what it is, you know. And um, and so, like, if I've ever worked with sixteen-year-olds who are struggling with maths, you can really see. You can you can go back to year R, and you can pinpoint where thing where things have been missed. And um, yeah, so I think you're absolutely spot on. And um, one thing that stand out, stands out, and um, because I know that people who listen are quite avid readers, where do they go if they want to find out more about reasoning as a predictor um, for um, later achievement? And obviously, I'm, I know I'm putting it on the spot, so we can add it to the show notes if uh, you know. But yeah. is there anywhere you think? Is there anywhere we really need to read that? I, I, yes, I, the the Nuffield Foundation produced a report, and I, and I can't tell you off the top of my head its name. Um, but it was talking about the um, reasoning as a predictor in comparison to um, arithmetic and spatial reasoning. And I think it, it, the, the report cited that that reasoning was a more powerful predictor than arithmetic, which was a more powerful predictor than, than spatial reasoning, but all predicted long term math success. Um, I, I, I will I will find the name of it as well and, and, and post that. Nice. Yeah, no, I, I, I do know I put you on the spot. Um, but um, certainly. I always find it fascinating when there's things like I've read things like um, maths success in maths is a better predictor of success in other subjects later you know later on at GCSE so you're you're whatever however you're doing at key stage one can go a long way to predicting how your science outcomes are in um, you know at, you know tw- twelve years later or whatever so yeah I find I find that stuff fascinating and you know and you know I think if we focus our attention on those things that are both really worthwhile in themselves, but also will help the pupils as they go through school. You know, and I think definitely that should be where our, our focus is. So if you had to condense your approach to the teaching of mathematics into a set of guiding principles, what, what would they be? Okay, so I hope this doesn't sound like a vague answer, but I, I, I think if I had to put that down into my philosophy, I would summarize that as trying to manage thinking and being a successful manager of children's thinking. And so I thought, well, what, 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 do, I, what do I mean by that? And I guess I'd be really understanding where children are at that moment in their journey towards knowledge acquisition and understanding, well, what do I want the children to be thinking about now? It was something that I found a, a, as a, a really useful guide for me in my teaching and, and understanding the difference between, well, is this, I, I would never say we learning a concept from, you know, from scratch, because of course we're always building on, on understanding in one way or another. Um, but is it, is it that we're kind of, first of all, exploring a concept 
um, then I, I might go around structuring that kind of learning activity differently than if it's actually I'm looking at a process and I'm breaking a process down into small steps and I want children to reason around those individual steps um, to is it we're looking for children to become fluent and or, or make connections or kind of synthesize different skills and, and, and I think it's just having that real understanding of well, where, where are the children now like what, what do they understand currently and how how is it that I'm going to take them to that to that next step and so I think that the kind of the external of what that looks like can be different so I think you, you could talk to a school and they say you know our approach is we use CPA or, or um, or we love using these kind of open-ended questions. And I would say that if you were to walk in one of my lessons, I'd like to think that they, they won't all look the same as one another. And it will depend on where in that, in that sequence we are. And of course, where the, where the children are as to, as to how that's adapted. And I, th I think it's often it's easy for schools to over apply and think, well, this is good pedagogy. Um, um, like, for example, um, concrete pictorial abstract and thinking that, well, how relevant is this representation at this moment for where the children are in, in their learning journey? So I, I guess that I would always think I, I'm always trying to manage the children's thinking really well. And, and that it might look different at different points. And I, I think it's a really important thing for, for teachers to have that understanding of, well, where are the children at the moment in this, in this sequence? Uh, it's really important to be able to almost look at th them and to be able to almost go forwards or backwards in that sequence if we if we need to be able to. Um, and having that skill as a teacher, I think, is really is really fundamental. Um, and I want to say having that skill as a, a teacher, I think it's just kind of having that having that awareness and that ability to reflect as well, um, which, which is kind of really helpful because you know with the best will in the world no one's lessons always you know we never get the outcomes that we want every every time but I think that, that the best teachers that I've worked with are those that are able then to look and reflect um, on successes and navigate those next steps. Nice I think yeah uh, you know in my in my mind what you're describing is that that step beyond proficiency towards expertise or toward you know that level of expertise that allows you to get the, the most out of every moment and um, what does you, what does your reflection process look like so whenever you're thinking back on your lessons is there anything you go through or is it you, do you just have a, a cup of coffee and think yeah that's a good well, well I'll tell you the, the, the first reflection process that, that I always have and this is something that I decided on a few years ago is that in every lesson I was going to have get into a discipline of having at least one moment in that lesson where I just stand and don't do anything or take any or, or uh, um, get involved in any conversation, but just look to all the different corners of the room and see everything that's happening and, and almost be able to that that to give me a little taste of different children's experience. And and to me that that was kind of one part of that of that reflection. Um, and then, of course, just having particular moments where you think, well, I I'm going to look for whether it's I'm going to watch um, this child or these, these children when we're talking about this thing. And I'm just going to listen to what they say, because I think that I would be too quick to jump in and think, well, how can I support the children? And I think it's really important that in the lesson we're thinking I've what I've got to be able to do now is is navigate the way forward well and taking in the information that's going to help me to do that. And of course, then having, uh, looking at children's outcomes and thinking, well, what, what's this showing me about their understanding, I think is, 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 is really important. And, and giving children those varied experiences. So, so you get a real snapshot of that, I think is, is really important. Nice. I think that's going to be really useful. And, um, you know, taking that time to step back from your lesson and survey, that, that's, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, I can see that being really a really useful piece of advice that people will go to. Um, and in your opinion, what's the single most important aspect of mathematics education? You know, easy, easier asked than answered, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think that's a, it is a great question. And, and I think for me, I would probably say it, it is both 
first of all, I'd probably say coherence is really important. And, and I think it's for um, that there, uh, a kind of school leadership level, that a lot of these things, I think, aren't the domain of the teacher to have to decide and to be in that position to do so. And I, I, and I would say it's that kind of real coherence in terms of whether it is the visual representations that, that children see and how, how we move into, um, it, you know, mental written methods, um, children becoming fluent, how we remove visual representations to go from, um, to develop an abstract understanding. Um, the kind of reasoning strategies, the types of headings of questions that children generally um, are exposed to, or how, how we introduce problem solving. And I, I would say that there's all, in each of those, there's obviously an enormous amount of pedagogy. But I would say that if we can have that coherent experience that children move through, um, then it, the obvious benefits for the, for the children. And I think also for the staff, them not having to kind of make all those choices um, and I know you talk about this in your book and, and it was really interesting. And, and I've seen this in a number of the schools that I've worked in, particularly, um, particularly for different reasons, rural schools and also school, the schools are supported in North Wales where there aren't the same um, number of resources actually written in Welsh for teachers to use. And, and a lot of teachers are having to make a lot of decisions. And so I think just over the course of time, there being coherence is, is really important. And, and then I think from a, from a teaching point of view, it's then just understanding, well, how do I take these big principles or, or, uh, around building children's understanding? And how do I just really focus on the pedagogical choices that I need to make in, in this lesson, in, these, in this sequence of lessons? And almost for teachers not to have to think about the visual representations that are used, the different question types that are available for a lot of these kind of big rocks to be in place and for this to be real coherence. And so then teachers can really think about and reflect upon and spend the time digging into the pedagogy of, well, how, how do I need to adapt to what the children are showing us? Because that is such a kind of emotionally draining and important role to take on, I, I feel, in, in the children, you know, for, for children to make, make great progress in maths. How do you how do you go about finding that coherence? Um, you know, because um, I'm sure people you know they know I always bang on about high quality textbooks. Do you have any sources you think? You know, obviously you've got the expertise to write a curriculum that is coherent. You know, almost from scratch. Um, but wh where do you go to for for the you know if, if, when you're looking to sequence um, the bigger picture curriculum kind of idea? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I, I, I would talk about that from my own, my own experience. So I guess the, the school that I, I worked at for the majority of my career, we actually um, kind of either side of the um, 2014 curriculum being introduced, that was something that we did a lot of work on. And we essentially were looking at how we built our own curriculum that became coherent. And that was a job that took... A, well, it was an ongoing process that took a number of years and there'd be different aspects to that that'd be focused on at any one time. Um, and, and, and since then, I've, I've worked in a number of different, you know, supporting a number of different schools. Um, and really, I guess I've, I've needed to fit in with their systems. And, and I've seen some schools using textbooks to do that, um, you know, which to totally understand. Because I think that the, the thing that I've seen, which has been most challenging, has been in particularly, I would say in truth, particularly in rural schools or in well schools that I've supported, um, like I say, where they, where they actually don't have those resources readily at hand. And the time that teachers, and in some cases, less experienced teachers have had to invest in actually mapping out the curriculum, and deciding the long-term plan, and where, where a lot of these choices have been made or have been having to be made by individuals and, and I think that um, now where, where, where it's worked best, I think it, planning a curriculum is unbelievably challenging. Um, and so I think really just digging into the expertise that already exists is crucial. Now, whether that's through a textbook, a scheme that you know, is aligned well with the school's philosophy, I've seen that being used really effectively. 
Um, whether it's something that uh, schools have developed over the course of time and they, and they and they build and they build certain aspects of that each year, for example, um, based on their you know their individual needs. I've seen that work to some extent as well. Um, but I think the thing that's really important is that th th this is something that is is um, is a big piece that's developed over time and tweaked to contexts. That it's not something that. And this might sound obvious, but it's not something that uh, that each individual teacher is having to do um, on a you know on uh, themselves or or, um, or that it swings too much over the course of time. Yeah, no, that no, makes a lot of sense. You know, things like the the NCTM spines, I think they're quite helpful. And I'm trying to think, it might be on, it might have been just before this season started. So I'm trying to place it in time as to where, my, what tense I'm using. Um, but I think the hardest part of getting into the spines is getting started. And, um, you know, because once you're in there, you know, there's so much rich thinking that has taken place, you know, to support, you know, certainly those progressions and calculation and things. And I think, yeah, I always recommend, you know, have a look, ask questions, you know, just like you would with, whenever people are looking at your resources and think well, what, why have decisions been made the way they've been made? And then, you know, it is helpful. And, um, you know, but obviously in, in my mind, in an ideal world, um, everything is set up in a way that we can focus on the, on the how rather than the what, but, um, but yeah, but I think that's really useful advice. And um, so in, in reference to the principles you outlined earlier, what might these look like in practice in a school that was doing a particularly good job of teaching mathematics? Yeah, I, I, again, really important question. I, I mean, one thing that I'd like to start with that I, get, I guess that I've seen that I, I think is real value is children being in really great and, and, and they've been really well established routines that might be routines that are or aren't specific to mathematics so like an example that I would that that I would cite is um because again I, I work in a number of different schools how in a school um the teacher gets silence uh, is that something that's just established and consistent between classes or or is that something that takes cer a, a certain degree of weight and that would be like a kind of an, an an obvious example um now then thinking about how does that apply to all the kind of mathematics routines. Now, there was a great, a great example from Matt Swain, again, you shared in, in, in your book, which talked about, well, when children are holding up the whiteboards, how do they do that? And how is it that they're, um, and then what does the teacher say? And I think that if we have already made all these, all those choices, um, then again, it puts you in a brilliant place to actually focus more of the thinking actually just kind of around the mathematics. Now, for me, one of the things, and again, one of the drivers behind the, the IC reasoning resources has been the idea that every time I introduce or every time a new reasoning technique, for example, is introduced, it will come with its own cognitive weight, if you like. And if there's real consistency with there of, well, this is how we introduce misconceptions. Um, and so, again, let, let's say I, my approach there might be, I would have, my starting point might be explain the mistakes. Um, and then I would progress when I'm more confident that children have that conceptual understanding to uh, which answer. Because actually earlier on, I don't want to present the which answer question and for children to choose the misconception. I want them to first have experienced the explain the mistakes examples. Um, so we then have higher success rate there or, or whether it's um, looking at variation sequences of questions do, do are they always introduced to children with the same heading and um, throughout the different year groups and do we have a a similar kind of thought process to attacking those questions and, and how we model that and, and again I, I think that when we when we do that we get that real consistency and we can kind of focus basically more on the on the on the actual maths content of that individual lesson. And, and I think then, and, and this is the thing that I always emphasize is then you have this grounding where children can really um, explore and be flexible because they can apply these same te techniques in all these different ways. And, and we can look at how we give children f 
fewer questions and they can be creative and notice patterns and 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 have this kind of real joy um because i i, I guess i guess the other thing is um is the idea that we have this consistency of that this is what maths is you know that it is inherently enjoyable i always think we're as humans we're kind of wired to look for and enjoy puzzles and challenges um and i think that when you again when you have all the kind of all the routines in place and i would say as well like the math specific routines it can open up that freedom which i think is is well it's given me a lot of the best teaching experiences of my career and and i and i think it is um is what it looks like in a school that's 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 doing a really great job. Nice, yeah, that, that, that's that's really powerful. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm trying to think of an example from. Sometimes when our teachers use well, all the time when they have a, a certain question that requires, you know, say, multiple solutions. One of the teachers initially took a photograph of me thinking. And then they now put that photograph, you know, beside that question. So it almost marks it out as this is one where certain types of thinking are encouraged, you know, like you say, multiple possibilities and, you know, explanations of, of answers and things, because quite often it'll be me getting an, getting an answer wrong. Like you say, you know, what's the mistake, you know, and, and the kids are all, well, he's not an expert, but I'm going to explain, <laughs> you know, what it is. And um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, no, hundred percent if we remove a lot of the novelty and um, then we get a lot richer maths, don't we? I think, yeah. I think that's a really powerful point. Um, Cause I'm thinking back to my old lessons um, and having six different activities and kids moving, moving around them and stuff. Um, but actually the load that you're bringing in isn't necessarily ideal. Um, yeah. So I think, I think you're absolutely spot on. And another one within that, that that has always resonated with me is just, is just like what all teachers in the school do at the point of an answer being given. Um, and I, I've always been been a big one of kind of introducing doubt when children when children answer a question. And I always think if that's consistent within a school, we don't just accept the first thing that they say. And generally, the more confident they are, the more I'll try try and make them doubt themselves. Now that can backfire if that's not something that they that they're accustomed to, um, but I think that having all of these little detailed, um, uh, well, let's say conversations that will lead to a kind of collective understanding, a collective approach, has huge power, and also it's got huge power for them opening maths up, which I think uh, which I think everyone aspires to do. I think I think schools for years. And years of um, I've looked. I remember reading a report about maths in America in the 1970s, and we're all thinking, well, how can we, how can we open maths up and make it more, you know, more reasoning, problem solving orientated? And I think that there's a lot of a lot of these details uh, enable us to do that. But having that consistency, I think, is key. There's, there's a really good paper on that um, introduction of doubt. Um, I think it was an unintended consequence. It was about early counting. And you know, when you're trying to introduce the idea of cardinality, they reported that when kids were asked how many a second time, they, even if they were correct, they instantly doubted themselves. And so like you said, it's about being aware that the, that the teachers are going, are going to probe, are going to ask questions. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I, I'll share, I'll share it. And in, certainly in the show notes and I send it across to you and um, yeah but there was you know because and, and I've seen it with my own kids I'm sure you have with, with yours and um, you know they'll count one two three beans into their hand and you go how many and they'll three and then you're all how many and then they're like well <laughs> you know well, what's he what's he doing here <laughs> you know and, you know and then they start recounting and stuff you know so that, I think I find that fascinating um, I, I love it that that's introduced at that age as well I think that's really powerful that same principle and so are there any pitfalls that those schools who struggle to provide, you know, a decent standard of maths education fall into, you know, that those listening maybe want to avoid? Yeah, I'd say for me, there are two things that, that resonate there. Um, the first one is entirely understandable. And, and I think it's something that I've definitely fallen into the trap of, which is good ideas in the wrong place. 
so, so, so seeing what, what we would consider to be good pedagogy um, and it just not really fitting in where the children are at in that in in their learning journey um, and so and like let me give a couple of examples of that so one might be um, you know we we aspire to represent mass structures using concrete pictorial abstracts now I, I think there's times where children have switched off from that to some extent if they're if they're not legitimate ways of modeling the mathematics so uh, again like a cpa you could see that as great pedagogy um and it can be for representing specific math structures but i think that sometimes if we kind of over apply that into every learning experience and that that's what we always have to do then, then i think that that's that's probably one one trap that I've, that I've seen a lot of the time and and that could apply that could apply to questions that I've written and I'd, I'd always say this to people you know if I was looking at a how many ways task it's not it's not a good question or a bad question I would think about well I know where I would use that in this sequence of lessons and and rather than thinking it's going to be this is going to be great maths um because it's there's reasoning there that that would be the thing I would think about not not good pedagogy or bad pedagogy, but why, in w when, in the right place. Um, and, and the other thing that I think is really important, and I think is really important now, especially, is where children's um, attainment is below age-related expectation. I think it's always, uh, tempting is the wrong word, but I think it's always um, a, a possibility that teachers will think, well, I at least want the children to be able to do this, and to go for what I would probably term the kind of low hanging fruit. And rather than thinking, right, well, you know, we've got a long time until, let, let's say let's say we call it the end game. And I've never really wanted to say this, but let's say the end game is when children are 16 and we want them to have this proficiency when they're 16. And it, it, if I look at things through that lens, I then think, well, what are the skills that I need to emphasize? They won't necessarily be um, the, the same thing as some of the outcomes that we might hope that children will have by the end of this week, by the end of this term, by the end of this year. So, so I would say if there was another, if there was another thing, it, it would be um, where we're trying to accelerate children's progress is looking for like little short term fixes rather than a little bit like you referred to earlier on, almost seeing the child when they're in year six and the consequences of some of the pieces they've missed out from in, in reception and and I think that is a complicated thing because I think it, it also is tied into accountability structures um, and the kind of the, the trust and the understanding that people have within the school um, around well here are some of the issues that we have and we aspire for these children to have real mathematical success in the long run but actually understanding that the pro the, the, there's a process to get there and um and it's important for us to see the long game in in that i, I think that they're, they're probably the, the things that really resonate from, from my experience yeah no i 100 agree um, and i'm thinking back to four years ago when i gave people copies of some of your questions and said right let's have a look at these and then you know explore them and then when we plan together we will we'll have a look and um, and, it, and very much was a case of the first conversation, the first question I would ask them is, well, why is this challenging in the context of your class? You know, um, because quite often you will find things labeled with them, you know, expected greater depth. Um, and, you know, I yeah, the, the question, should, you know, because that won't always be the case with it, as you, as you rightly say. And so it's, it's looking at a question, like um, you know, where you have ones where you want to rank, um, rank by difficulty, yeah. um, and I think understanding when it's appropriate to use that or when you're going to get the most from that makes a huge difference because we, I think we can give it to kids, you know, when we want to, but as you as you say, to get the most from it, there are certain pieces that need to be in place in that jigsaw, um, and so I was having those conversations. Because what what you're always aiming for is having you like you say you hit the nail absolutely on the head. Your teachers in a place where they can justify any decision they make, you know, 
And I always talk about Ofsted coming in and the fact that we as primary teachers will quite often be more experienced in primary mathematics than, than many of the inspectors will be. Um, and so I want my teachers to be confident to say, I made this decision because of that. Yeah, so I, I totally, totally yeah. get that. I think that's hugely powerful when, when people can say, the, the structure, uh, you know, I've structured this lesson or this activity or this discussion in this way because the children are at this point in the journey. Um, rather than expecting consistency to look like um, all our lessons look the same. And I think that's, that's really important. Yeah, it's a, it's a dream situation where you've, you've got all the resources, but the kids know where to go to if they need them. You know, obviously, if you're introducing some, a new structure, you'll guide them towards something that is best suited. Um, but then, you know, yeah, I think you, you may mention earlier on, you know, we don't have manipulatives just because we have manipulatives. You know, it, is it going to be something that draws out the mathematics? Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, I'm very much on board with that. And, I'm, and as you're speaking, I'm thinking about my experience of the last couple of years and, and those teachers who, once they reach that level, they start teaching me stuff because they're doing it day, day in, day out and, they, and they're learning and they're refining their processes and, and, then, and then they sort of share their advice with, with me. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think changing slightly, um, in your opinion, what are the features of a high quality maths curriculum? And we, we almost touched on this subject a little bit uh, yeah, that, that, that's right. And I, I talked about, you know, coherence, I think is really important. And I, just to say that I think that structuring a coherent maths curriculum is incredibly difficult to do. And, and, and I think that it's something that needs to develop over time and be fat, fit to the school's circumstance, but really kind of digging into expertise of others that are, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants with that, I think is so important. Um, and then, you know, again, uh, perhaps a generic response to that, that might be kind of focusing on big, the big mathematical ideas um, is, is really important and thinking these are, the, these are the big rocks that we need to put in place and looking at how the kind of mathematics fits within that, I think is really important. Um, I, I always, I, I've always seen maths as well. Uh, um, you know, when you, when you look at maths in, in different countries and, and the kind of what, what's in the curriculum will differ. But the, the idea that what we're almost doing is ch teaching children also how to learn mathematics and how to, how to connect what I currently understand and to be able to stretch that into new content. And in doing so and, and building really rich sequences of maths learning, I always think we're, we're helping children to learn how to learn mathematics. And if we do that, um, then I, I think, again, it takes this emphasis away on, on coverage because actually we know that in building this capacity, we build our capacity to accelerate later. And it's, it's this old adage that I, I'm sure that, you know, people have mentioned a hundred times before, but you can accelerate children quickly in maths later, I, I think. That, but if you build this coherence earlier on, I think that's, that's really important. And a, big, and a big part of that for me is this consistency of actually what, what, um, what reasoning looks like. And, and for example, how problem solving can be introduced um, where children have relatively high success initially with that and kind of consistency with that, I think, I think is, is, is really key. Um, and, I, and I guess the, the other thing that I would say about a high quality maths curriculum that I, I've been passionate and I, and I still am of how, how I can support teachers as best as possible to actually make this a uh, reality is how it can be a, 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 um, a subject that children experience as as open and creative or with a capacity for for children being creative because i think i think that what i, I always remember visiting a a high school and seeing um and it was actually in the day where they were looking at level six tests they were help, supporting primary teachers to prepare children for level six tests and i always remember seeing this huge database a teacher going through when i think there was a question that came up about negative numbers so the teacher went to spring term week four, uh, set three, you know, Tuesday, bring up, there's the presentation. And listen, it's not for me to judge. I have no experience of, of teaching in high school. So it's not for me to judge that scenario. But I guess the thing that really resonated with me is the idea that I want children to feel like their response and their discovery is in some way unique. 
And I think that children having that experience of uniqueness um, is really powerful. And again, I, I feel like that is often built on the, to some extent, it's, it's also built on the opposite of the, of the, of the precise direct teaching. Um, and then having these consistent structures that are used for embedding reasoning, but that being a, a, an end as well, that we, that we want children to have this, uh, this kind of joy and the, be able to engage in the kind of emotional aspect of mathematics as well, um, which, which to me is, is one of the kind of, uh, one of the signs, one of the outworkings of a, of a, of a great curriculum. It, it's hard to beat, um, you know, when, pe- when pupils realise some mathematical generalization, you know, um, you know, like um, when you add three consecutive numbers and when they, when they see what's happening, you know, you just see the light bulb going off and, um, you know, because they're like, wow, wow, wow. And then, and then they want to test that more, you know, even, you know, using Numicon and stuff like that there. In your ideal curriculum, how does problem solving feature, you know, to what extent, you know, and um, cause you're obviously, t- you mentioned about problem solving, getting the place it deserves. Mm-hmm. What, what would your approach, your general, I know because it's hard to pin down general because obviously you're talking about the right tool at the right time, but in general, how do you see it featuring in, in your curriculum? Yeah, the, the, this is a question that absolutely fascinates me. And I, I think I'll end up exploring. Uh, so so I'm, I'm in, in, you know, I'm one part on a, on a journey towards that. I think there's a few pieces there. One, one is this idea that, um, sometimes context can give children, ch- children can enrich mathematics or can, it can be like a, a mental model for children because they might understand and be familiar with the context. So I think there's instances where we can look at context rather than as adding challenge is actually adding, adding support and actually helping to build on children's mental models. So that's just something that I, I often look out for in particular aspects of the, of the maths curriculum. Um, like let's say we're looking at rounding contexts where we would and wouldn't round say it might be something that we can we can look at examples like why a doctor might not round if they were measuring and you know an an amount of medicine to give a patient I think children would have some kind of intuitive feeling for that but actually when, when it comes to problem solving the things that I found really interesting around problem solving is the idea that you know non structured maths comes with a really heavy cognitive load um, that children can problem solve, them, but they can find it really hard to assimilate those experiences um, with their kind of wider experience of mathematics. Um, that problem solving is very domain specific. Um, so I have to use, I have to have encoded lots of, um, lots of kind of sub, you know, domain specific ideas to have success in problem solving. But I think there's a real thirst and, and problem solving is a really important part of a child's whole you know so we have this kind of warp and weft of mathematics and and i think it's something that in my experience then not all children have sufficient experience of um and i think that's because it's a really pedagogically i think it's the, one of the most difficult things to develop um and i i would look at within sequences of lessons um where do we build problem solving um, and and rich problem solving experiences. When we're introducing those problem solving experiences, how do we make sure we build up to those by building the domain specific knowledge that children will need to answer that specific question, I think is really important. Um, I think it's then really important that we look at questions where, um, and and consider the variation between the examples children are given um, and children seeing kind of related problem solving tasks um, together so that it helps them to make those connections between different problem solving experiences and, and, and all this I just uh, like I feel like is something that I that fascinates me but it's extremely difficult I feel for a time pressured teacher to do well um, and so that is something that I want to spend and you know and I, and I hope to some extent the IC problem solving provides some of that coherence within problem solving because we know that kind of discrete problem solving tasks are you know children don't have high success rate or high enough success rate certainly initially um and then they'll struggle to connect those experience the wider the wider experience of mathematics so kind of looking at ways of bridging that i think are, are super important and i think there's an enormous appetite for that 
um, it's, I just think that the, the pedagogy of making that happen is, is a challenge. And, and again, that's something that I, as well as I hope to um, be able to fill that space, I also really want to be able to engage in just genuine dialogue with people around what that looks like for them. Um, where, you know, if you're the, the teacher of the year four to six class at a rural school, or if you're, this is something that you've been working with, you know, in a, in a different context. How does that work for you? What works? What doesn't? I, I think, I think that is a big picture, um, and I, I think it, it's one that there's less coherence around. Yeah, I think when you say massive appetite, you're absolutely right, and I almost to an extent felt really bad for asking, but I know that people will be really interested to know what you think because you know my approach to it changes depending on the school's context and where they are in their journey and stuff. You know, sometimes you've got to do the basics really well, and then we can move into sort of the more creative stuff, you know, pedagogically. Um, you know, so I, so I do appreciate the difficulty of answering that question. Um, almost on the spot. So, yes. Yeah. I, I, I tell you, the other thing that I should add to that, that, that is something that I've explored, I'd say in the last kind of eight, 12, 18 months, has been the idea of what, what I'd call numberless problems. So looking at, and this is probably quite bespoke to worded problems, but looking at essentially, and this is again something that I would kind of encourage everyone to play around with, is the idea of taking a question structure, removing or hiding the numbers, or even hiding the question, and getting children exploring different possible questions or finding different possible solutions. So our, our focus is on underlying structures. And I think there's great, there's great scope there as well. That, that's something that I know I've done a lot of work with teachers who, are, who have explored that and had great success also. Where do you go to to find out about those structures? Do you have a source of inspiration or did you, is it just through experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it's a combination of those things. And, and I don't, it's almost a little bit chicken and egg, I think, for me. Because I'll, I'll generally take in, um, I, I've, I've picked up various bits from um, educators overseas uh, over the course of time. Um, and I, I actually remember introducing this and, and I, I genuinely had believed it to be my own idea. Um, and then someone had said to me, oh, that's just like the work of, and it, it, the, the, the name will come back to me and it, it isn't Robert Kaplinsky, but that was another, an, another chap that, um, whose work was, was referenced to me. It, it was Brian Bushart who'd written a blog around numberless problems. And, and it, it's very possible that I'd read that previously and forgotten about that. But a, a kind of combination of, of, of reading, experimentation, teaching lots of different contexts, uh, seeing what works, what doesn't work, that that's kind of how how I've got there, and I, and I think that's always a you know it is a great blueprint really of taking ideas, trialing them, seeing what works, what doesn't work, um, and having that kind of curiosity. I'm always very wary of my episodic memory, or at least remembering when I when I heard things or when I said things. Is, is shocking you know and sometimes I have the same conversation with people two or three times <laughs> or you know um, but um, Chris Such and I are actually in the middle of a conversation that we've agreed to pause and come back at after we've read a bit more but I'm convinced that we can classify certainly at primary all the arithmetic structures in problems or the structures that you'll find a problem in um, and he's not so sure he thinks that I, I think it's finite but I am yet to classify them. and he thinks no there's actually um, a much wider scope than I'm giving credit for and um, so we, we say we'll come we'll come back in May and uh, <laughs> with with more evidence and <laughs> but you're absolutely right it, it's 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 fascinating and I think um, you know the more work that can be done in that field to give teachers you know, guidance and support, then, you know, the better, I think. Yeah, there's also a little article from the, from, on the Ericsson Institute that someone pointed me towards, I haven't done some training, which was on the three reads math protocol, which is a very similar principle of looking at a, a worded question, uh, reading the, almost decoding the information, then um, reading it, I think it was reading it without the question, and then... And then the third read is, is the question in its original form. And I, I, I read that and thought, you know, I, I've never had an original idea in my life. <laughs> yeah. 
it's very hard. You know, it's like um, I come up with a new pop song. You know, every riff has been, has been written. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we may have touched on this one as well, um, particularly certainly with the long term. But how do you approach planning, you know, maybe more specifically in the, in the short term? What, what's your what's your routine? When you're planning yeah, that, 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 that's that's a good one. Well, I think when, when I say what's my routine, often because now that's intertwined with the the members of staff that I'm working with, in essence, um, and and so in in truth, that probably depends a little bit on uh, on where those individuals are in terms of their you know their experience. Um, that so often with um, with less experienced members of staff, we'll be looking at specific. Uh, teaching techniques or routines that we're establishing. Um, again, one, one mistake that I, I think that I've made in working in schools has been trying to embed too many things or, or working in the same way with a teacher with more experience than the teacher who's kind of building that expertise. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question here entirely, but we, we it, it would be looking at, you know, with teachers who are kind of earlier in that journey, looking at establishing more, maybe how is it that we use misconceptions and, and what's a routine for that that will work for your class? Whereas the then the thing that I think is interesting then is, is otherwise is looking at um, how I, because I don't think I, I talked earlier about managing thinking and I, and I think it's an interesting idea and this whole process of reflection and refinement as we're going along of this ability. And I know you wrote about this very eloquently in your, in your book of, of having a look at this is what we're trying to learn over a sequence of lessons. And I have this bigger picture understanding of that and how I can kind of almost move forwards and back. I'm not misquoting you here. I can move forwards and backwards within that and think, well, actually this is, I need to go back to this thing, which, which, a piece from before or I need to I need to embed this understanding or actually this is where we're going to go and having that whole picture whether that's even going kind of across years I think is 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 a real is a real a real skill to have um, and would be the thing that I try and maintain that awareness of, of of kind of not being too bogged down in the what the detail of what's happening today and being able to understand where this fits within the bigger picture so again, I don't know if that answers your original question at all or not, but that 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 would be something around my thought process. No, I think I think it does because you're saying in the moment you're directing pupil thought as much as is humanly possible, but you're also aware of this wider um, importance. And like you say, you know, is what I'm introducing in year two going to be detrimental when they get to year four, or is it going to be is it going to impact positively? You know, when they get to year four, you know. Um, yeah, so I think no, I think that's really clear. Um, but I think, yeah, planning's different. You know, I, I think I plan with maybe six, seven different teachers a term, and everybody's got a different sort of way of looking at things. Um, but I think, yeah, from uh, as much as is humanly possible, try and you know, go along that, those lines that you're going along um, and how that actually manifests just depends on the person, doesn't it? Um, so the next one I've been really looking forward to asking and um, because your approach to task design is on a, an absolute level of its own. Um, and obviously, if there are trade secrets that you don't want to give away, you know, then feel free not to. And um, what's your what process do you work through when you sit down and design a mathematical task? Yeah, OK. Well, the, I, I, as I say, I don't think I have any any original thought that I could I could call my own anyway. Um, it, it would be. When I when I'd be looking at designing a a section of, uh, for example, one of the IT reasoning ebooks, I, I'd have this this fairly structured thought process in my, in my mind, which would be thinking, well, will first of all, will children have an intuitive understanding of this aspect of mathematics from their lived experience? So, can I tie into contexts that will help to familiarise them and, and will provide some kind of mental model with maths? And in, in essence, if it does, I'll try and I'll try and use them. If it doesn't, I won't. So an example might be um, when I'm looking at measurement and we're looking at different forms of measurement. Uh, I might um, ask children, how could you work out the cost of an apple at the supermarket? Um, and, and then we, that, that could be something that where we could think about the different forms of measure 
and the need for different units of measure. In other aspects of maths, what I would hate to do early in a learning episode is try and shoehorn a context in that doesn't work. Um, then I would generally think about, well, concepts. For, for this, what's the underlying structure of this maths concept? How is it best represented? And have a general range of representations that I'll, that I'll use as go-to representations. Um, and, and how can I showcase the underlying structure of the maths? Then I, ge I generally be thinking, well, what do I want the children to be thinking about? And, and what do I want to focus their thinking on? Particularly early is requiring knowledge. So I'll think, well, what are the likely misconceptions? How can I get children talking about those misconceptions by um, explaining the, the mistakes? Or again, then this slightly different process of which answer? Um, and I would generally go in that order of children, first of all, explain the mistakes, then identifying correct answers and explaining misconceptions. Um, and then I, I, I would, um, again, I'll kind of demystif demystify myself here a little bit. I would generally go to think about from Craig Barton's second book, but the idea of building sequences of questions um, that um, so children have this opportunity for intelligent practice um, so they can apply their understanding and then see connections between questions when the difference between those questions is relatively minimal. And I think there's just enormous power there. Um, and again, I, I, I would refer anyone to, to, to that book, which I think was outstanding, really fabulous for showing how it's a vehicle for getting children essentially rehearsing the, the calculation or, or the, uh, the process that they've been taught but then so much opportunity for reasoning built within there. Um, and, and then usually when, when I've explored that aspect, it might be the certain reasoning tasks we look at for children explaining the thought process. And then I'd, I'd normally look at, well, how do I then take this concept that we've been exploring and how do I interleave that with other aspects of maths? Um, and how do I vary the challenge? Um, we might bridge into uh, kind of systematic thinking with a how many ways task. And so I'll generally look at, well, how can I take these same structures and apply it to this math concept, assuming that they do apply. And then again, the, the pedagogy around problem solving might be slightly different because then it'd be a similar process, but I'd be thinking, right, can I use a numberless problem here? Um, what are the precursors to children being able to answer this problem solving task? How, how can I build that or, or recap that domain specific expertise? Once they've done that, um, how do I give children varied practice of these ideas? So, so I'll generally take what is a um, what is a kind of depressingly formulaic uh, approach, and then think, well, how do I apply this in this meaningful way in this aspect of the curriculum? So, so that that's that is probably fairly well my thought process. Now, you, you said depressingly formulaic, but actually, it goes back to what you were saying earlier on about when you've got those structures in place then you can be creative, you know, so essentially you've got that, you've got this structural representation running the whole way through and what you've made over time are lots of different avenues. If I'm interpreting it correctly, that you can do, like you Absolutely. said, and um, you know, which, which I think will be really helpful to people thinking because sometimes there can be so much on offer or so many ways you can take things that it might be overwhelming. But if, if anyone's at the beginning of their journey and they think, well, if I take the structure, and then I tried it one way, then over the course of a year, you might get reasonably good at writing four or five different types of questions, you know, adjusting challenge, but in different directions, you know, that could take a whole year of, of intense focus and stuff um, to get a handle on. And um, yeah, so that, I think that's, that's really clear and, and, and really useful. So what would you recommend anyone wishing to develop their mathematical prowess in terms of teaching, you know, should read, you know, books, papers, blogs, and podcast is there anywhere you go to you know think you this is must read or must listen yeah that's a good question well like there's, there's been a few things that i've um that i over the course of a number of years and i guess to be honest I, I, i've probably gone from um people that i've really respected and i've read a lot and and listened to a lot and then i've kind of built that wider um, and, and have kind of moved over the course of time. So I think at first I, I read a lot of um, work by Joe Bowler 
And then um, there's actually a lady called Christina Tonneville who talked a lot about early number sense. And then uh, the, from there, I kind of was, it, I say signposted, I kind of picked up and studied a lot around the Ericsson Institute. And so I think, I think reading as broadly as possible is, is really important. Um, to, to answer that, I guess if, if someone was to read one and think, well, I, I, I want something that I can, as, as a starting point, I, I think that Rosenshine's Principles of Instruction are really powerful um, by Tom Sherrington. Um, again, I think that Craig Barton's first book was really good in terms of uh, as a signpost for teachers to be able to find, well, these are different aspects of maths pedagogy that I can go and explore. Um, so, so I think that that was, that was a, a great starting point as well. Um, let me tell you, because I'm sure you own the, the, uh, your own book, Kieran, which, um, and the things that I think people can get from that. I think it's really important in looking at the different, and, and it really made me think about the different phases of, um, of the development that you go through in, in your career and the, and the importance of managing your own uh, and staff in your school's career development in, in, in a, looking at that from the, in, you know, from the long term. And actually understanding how we develop expertise. We, you know, we need a lot of time to develop specific skills and to make them automated, much like we talk about children needing to do so. Um, and then there's so much kind of detail as well in terms of the pedagogy, whether it's how, um, how bar models need to, you know, seeing see the movement within uh, a bar model or a representation, which I thought was really interesting. So there's so many different sources. And, I, and again, I, I kind of encourage people to just think in an open-minded way and take in information from lots of different people. I think I've learned from a huge number of people over the course of my career. And the, the other thing that I'd say is the, the people who are naturally listening to this podcast uh, will be the, the, I'm sure the people that generally do immerse themselves in um, in research and, and find that fascinating. And I understand that not every teacher can, you know, with the time pressures, um, you know, of, of just the job itself. But I think it's really important as well that there is someone in every school, almost every teacher has access to almost like what you could call a gatekeeper of, 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 of all this information. And specifically, if it's you, that if you are that gatekeeper, the importance of developing really fantastic relationships um, and vulnerable relationships in your school, I think is just crucial. So for me, I think that like, it was easier to do earlier in my career and to show that vulnerability was easier because I, I, um, I, I because people understood that I was earlier in my career. Equally to some extent, maybe I was keener to close the door because I wasn't as competent um, but let me tell you, when, when, I, when I moved into, from teaching year six to teaching year one, um, I, I was in a two form entry school and the teacher who, in the other year one class was called Claire. And Claire was amazing because we'd planned these lessons together and whatever we'd planned, she would be delivering it better than I would. And of the, the only thing I'll give myself credit for in that time when I was working with Claire, I think, was that when things weren't going as well for me, I'd say, Claire, come in here. Tell me what you're doing that's different to what I'm doing. And a lot of the times she'd say something like, I didn't use whiteboards there. I photocopied that because, um, and actually what that did in me actually trying to point to the challenges that I had, and believe me, there are a lot of them, was, then it opened up this door and, 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 and I didn't do it for this reason, but it would open up the, the door where she would feel like she could say to me, Gareth, what do you think about this? Um, or how does this apply? You know, because we had that kind of vulnerable relationship. Now, I, I did that just to pick up on her expertise. It wasn't so that it would be reciprocal. But I think that building that culture and modelling being vulnerable um, when you're later in your career can be difficult. And I think that's absolutely crucial. And um, whenever I first ventured into nursery, I was actually covering my wife's nursery class. She wasn't my wife at the time. Um, but I remember on the drive home, I'd be like, why did this happen? Why, why did that happen? And then she would explain to me bit by bit, you know, because I, I, early years is 
physically exhausting and and then she but piece by piece she was making life a whole lot easier for me <laughs> so I can, I can relate to your story about it. <laughs> absolutely and it was very, very humbling at the time I have to say um because I understood so many principles but I had no idea and this sounds ridiculous naive when I look back here now but I had no idea about the significance of all the little logistics um and having taught in year one it made me think oh I did so much you have so much more aware teaching older children of yeah. some of the things that have a small weighting, which would be derailing my lessons in year one. But yeah, so Claire was an absolute lifesaver that year, I have to say. Yeah, because even the language you use is, is totally different, you know. And the, you know, I, I my, my go to is use fewer words but with more accuracy. And um, because in, when I'm in year six, I will often be having a joke with them at the same time as I'm teaching them. But I don't think that that translates down because you're given far too much, you know, it, it would be extraneous information. You know, I, I don't think young younger children handle that very, very well or to the same extent. And, um, you know, so the, 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 like you said, they're very, very small decisions that we need to make, but can have a massive impact. And um, I, I should also say thank you for including me in such esteemed company. I'm not sure it's 100% earned, but I, I really do appreciate the uh, the kind words. And, you know, whenever I saw you were reading, I was like, wow, you know, this is this, this is when you find out John Lennon's listening to your music. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's very kind as well. No, but but I think it, it, it's a really, it's, I love um, books like that that really dig into just the detail of the pedagogy. Um, and I think that's what there's a, you know, there's always a thirst for. So, yeah, really kind of well done, because it's also quite intimidating doing something like that. And I've had this myself where when when it's published, that's that's it's there in stone. And often I, I've looked at things that I've thought, oh, you know, I'd go back and I'd tweak this and I'd change that. So I think there is a bravery in putting and um, putting yourself out there. So good on you for, for that as well. Yeah, I think it's through. Um the support of the people who've been on the podcast in the, in the past, um, you know, certainly helped me be a bit more confident in my, in what I have to share, because it's not my natural default. And it's like, Oh yeah. Like you say, the minute it's published, you read something else. You're like, Oh, I should have included that. And yes. <laughs> yeah. No, so I, I owe them a huge grat of or debt of gratitude, um, you know, for, for their support with that. Um, so I think as we've, we've mentioned a few times, your work has inspired many, Will no doubt continue to do so for a long time to come. Where do you draw your inspiration from? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I, the, the truth of that is I think I'm inherently ridiculously driven anyway. Um, so I'd be the kind of person that um, rather than kind of, like I, I'd play a lot of sport and, and rather than seeing that as a nice social thing I could do on a Saturday, I'll, I'll really want to improve in every way I possibly can. So that's probably a little bit wide in my DNA. But, but the... Um, Truthfully, I, I think that where I get my real inspiration from has been uh, the two things that I'd probably point to is one is just the amazingly passionate people that I've worked with and how that they, they aspire to have really rich experiences for children. But also people are so time pressured. Um, and I always think with, with teaching, we get so many, you know, so many teachers that have to teach so many lessons at such a fast pace um, and are really passionate about wanting to give children the best experiences they can. And it's just very difficult to do that and have enough time to, to reflect on your own practice and to actually change. Like I know, I know in my career, I always felt like it was difficult to improve because there is such immediate demand on yourself. And again, going back to a kind of analogy to do with sport, like I play... A little bit of golf and if you're always in competition it's hard to improve and I often think it's a little bit like that with teaching we, we kind of have our, our, um, our habits and our default modes and we will fall back to them because there's so much pressure on what we can bang out and I guess for me I'd love to stand in that space of how do I help time pressured passionate teachers to give children the experiences in maths that, that, that they want them to experience um, and and also, I guess, to some extent as well, with the schools that I've worked in, and in a variety of different contexts, or, or also, well, let's say you're um, in the first couple of years of your teaching career, and you're looking at wanting to develop teaching a problem solving and do it coherently. 
and I, or you know or, or building reasoning in daily maths lessons can I make that as easy as possible for you and that's something that that's that's always really driven me and and to some extent as well I, I think that it also ties to my own experience because I um when I you talked about my background at the beginning and that there was a year when I was um assistant head teacher uh, I was full-time in year six I had a, a young family so I had um two children under the age of four um I actually had to do um for you know just kind of personal circumstances I I did a lot of parenting at that time as well um and I wanted to do everything really well and it was extremely extremely difficult um you know we we all work in um it, it, people are always ridiculously busy and and time poor um and I really want to be able to support teachers to um to be able to kind of give children experiences that they crave within those limitations. Nice. Yeah, I, I can totally see that. Um, and yeah, two kids under four plus an assisted and year six. Uh, that must have been some time, you know. And that, and that was actually whilst I was I was almost getting starting some maths training and writing some resources and and <laughs> I'm wanting to focus on those on that kind of big goal um but difficult to do that when you work in x many hours as well one thing i'm sure everyone listening will be keen to know is what does the future hold for gareth metcalf and what can we look forward to over the next while yeah well I, 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 the the thing that i'm gonna really invest as much as i, I can in is is um the idea of uh, developing pedagogy around problem solving and i, I this is something that i find just it, again, it, it fascinates me for the reasons that I'd, I'd gone into before. I just think it's such a, the, the evidence around it is it's so difficult a skill to develop, I believe. Um, and to give all children rich six, um, experiences in problem solving and success in problem solving. Um, and, and I think that that is around coherence as well of, um, and, and that's something that, uh, again, I've, I've I've got a philosophy towards that is built on my kind of current knowledge and understanding. Um, but the thing that I really want to be able to do is, is engage really well and more than ever with teachers and their lived experience um, and, and how that can be pieced together most effectively and develop ped pedagogy around that. Because I think there's 101 rich, uh, 101, a million and one rich problem solving tasks for that I could I could give children I actually think like really embedding problem solving so that children have high enough success rate in problem solving and they are really successful in assimilating those experiences within their um within their understanding of mathematics I think that's a really difficult thing to do well and I guess that I've got plans and ideas for resources that I can write to to do that but really what I I want to be able to do is is um is i don't know if network's the right word but is, is tap into as many great minds as possible and, and when i say great minds I, I guess what i really also mean is to really understand people's experience whether that is through of their experience of my resources or um of teaching maths generally on on how that can be achieved because like i say i think there's an, an enormous appetite for that and and that will be a a, a big thing, uh, hopefully a direction that, that math teaching will grow in. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd love to be kind of a part of that development in pedagogy in, in problem solving. So that that's where I see, I, I never make too many long term plans, but that's where I see myself heading for, for the for this little season, at least. Nice. That, that's, that sounds amazing. Um, and I think a lot of people will be really interested to be a part of it. Do you have a preferred method of contact, you know, before everybody floods your direct messages on Twitter <laughs> with, uh, with well, loads of messages? <laughs> yeah, the, the thing, I, I, I do, I try and, I can easily miss little messages that come through on Twitter. So the best way to get hold of me generally is my email, which is icmaths at hotmail.com. Um, the other thing that I do is, uh, is, and I'll kind of increasingly do this over the next period, is try and send out little samples of tasks and things that I've got a mailing list for, um, which hopefully people find really useful and will kind of add value as well. Um, but yeah, but really, really trying to drive the interaction around that. And so I'm really, really excited about that. 
Excellent, yeah. And so is there any final advice you give to those teachers who are listening or energized and ready to up their mathematics game? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that just to join me on the journey around problem solving, because uh, I think that is an interesting thing to explore. The idea of, like I've mentioned before, about exploring those kind of numberless prompts and that idea. I think there's there's kind of great, great potential in there. And then again, I, I don't know if this is a, is, a, is a little bit of a cop out, but I'll mention it anyway. I, I, um, I read a book called Be More Toddler, um, which I thought was was really interesting, um, which is by Emma Turner. And it's just, it's just a thing that isn't math specific, but that really resonated with me. And I, I think I could have taken it with my career. It, it, she talked about how toddlers, when they, when they learn and when they fail, are very kind of playful. And I think that I've, I've perhaps been so determined to do well in my career that I think just, just exploring and being playful and kind of reflecting lightly on my own lack of success is really valuable. And so I think, again, playing with some of the things that we've discussed and then, but just being, just doing it with lightness, I, I, I think would be a kind of general piece of advice that I'd give anyone. I really, really kind of really enjoyed reading Emma's book on, on that lines. And, and that was certainly one of the things that I took away from that, but to just, just enjoying the job and just being playful and, ref, and reflecting lightly on any of this kind of successes and difficulties that you have. Yeah, no, that, that, you're absolutely right. There's enough pressure in the world without putting more on ourselves whenever we're doing, you know, some what, what could be a really fun part of our job. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that one. So then the last thing, and let's see, hopefully this works. We've got the tier list. Yeah, I can see um, SABC. Excellent. Um, so you may or may not be familiar with this bit because it only features on the YouTube versions. Um, but essentially the tier list is... Um, okay, I haven't seen It's an old gaming thing where you would have like um, the characters from Mario ranked be it based on who you wanted to use in, in your battles and stuff. So like S tier is, is like the God tier, the ultimate, you know, sensational. A is very strong. You know, you would use them. B is about average and C is below average. Um, I'll give you an example. We were doing history topics and Neil Alman put dinosaurs in fact everybody who was given that question put dinosaurs in c because they didn't see how it connected to the rest of the history curriculum um, and so what i've got i've got four of my favorite ic reasoning questions um, and you're going to rank them <laughs> um, okay. completely subjective um, and so the first one is rank by difficulty Okay, and so you, you want me to rank this as S, A, B, or C? Exactly, yeah. And so the top is outstanding, C is below, is subpar, and everywhere in the middle. Okay. Um, so, so this one, I, I will give this one, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give this one a B. Any reason for that? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that you, again, it, it's one of those where a little bit like you'd referred to earlier needs to be used in the right, in the right place in a learning sequence. Because if we, if we don't have the right mental written strategies, then, um, then it might, it might, um, we might not engender the thinking that we're looking for. Um, but I, I like this one for, for being able to move between the different, as I say, different mental and written strategies and, and to be able to explain what creates difficulty as well um so yeah I'll, I'll go for i'll go for b for that one i love them i i'd, I'd probably have them in s but it's your it's your list so i'm, I'm just mentioning as an aside and um, you get some really powerful thinking and um, when you when you pose those kind of questions and um, to the right people at the right time and um, so the next one is mental or written yes okay yeah um Let's go for um, yes. Yeah, so I'll I'll go I'll go for I'll go for A here. So I um I've used men mental or written quite a lot. I like the idea that children. I mean, children naturally go for it's the number of di the digits that determine whether it's mental or written, and it's trying to kind of throw that on its head a little bit. Um, so yeah, so um, I, I like that one. The, the different mental strategies again, similar to the previous question. Insofar as it needs to be in the right place, children need to have the right expertise uh, as a precursor. 
So yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll go for A there. Nice, great. Yeah, if I was only ever allowed to tell teachers one piece of advice, it would be to ask whether something should be done, could be done mentally, or whether it should, it, it absolutely needs to be written. Um, yeah, because I, I find all the different options kids have, you know, somewhere between the end of year one and the middle of year two, and um, really fascinating. And um, so yeah, I love the, I love those questions, and then the reasons why always change. You know, depend on on who you're talking to, um, and then one we've already mentioned. Uh, explain the mistakes. Yes. Okay. Explain the mistakes. Um, so, yeah, th this one's an interesting one as well because it's um, sometimes when it's actually it's actually understanding the likely mistakes that children have. So let, let me just see if that's actually the case here. So in mistake three if we're looking at the calculation 12 subtract five, it's actually around um, probably a teacher understanding that what that might manifest in 12, 11, 10, nine, eight. Um, so, and that might be something that perhaps isn't as immediately apparent to children that we might need to draw out. So I, I'm gonna categorize, it, it, we don't need one in each category, do we? No, no, it's absolutely up to you. Where you could have them yeah, all. I'll, I'll, I'll um, but explain the mistakes is a structure that I use so, so frequently that I can't put it any less than A. So let, let's go for A there. I think you're being really humble about this. <laughs> um, and the last one, is it the same? Yes, okay. Now that's an interesting one because I actually package in, in the new um, I, I see reasoning resources, I kind of put this idea in a slightly different title. Um, but yeah, I, I like that one. and. This is a, the, the, the concept, for example, of looking at doubling and halving in multiplication, I think is really powerful and can be really underused. Um, so we've looked at this in like multiplying fractions and how if we actually understand this concept, if I was, you know, um, three, if I was doing three and a half um, multiplied by seven, uh, multiplied by six, that I could just double and halve. And so that's one that I love toying around with. Uh, is it the same? Um, so, and again, we've got the kind of miscon the likely misconceptions there. So, yeah, I've, I've used that one a few times, actually. So, go on, I'll call that one one of my S's. Excellent. So, we've got, is it the same? What's the title in the, in the new versions? Uh, the title in the new versions, well, that, that might, might well manifest itself as either a, um, as an I know so, or that principle might end up being outworked in the small difference questions. And the basic idea was to, to have fewer titles that children are familiar with. So it'll be, it'll be this kind of same underlying structure, um, but again, pieced together slightly differently. Excellent. Um, yeah, because whenever I was looking for this, whenever I was making this document, I thought I just went into my emails to see where the Etsy email was from whenever I bought it. And obviously I've gone for lower key states too. But yeah, it, it was, I think it was when you were talking to the deputies that I, I realized that there was... Um, it would have now gone year group, and um, so yes. as soon as we go back to to school, I'll be uh, I'll be exploring those ones with uh, with my teachers. Um, yeah, great. Well, hopefully they're a lot more comprehensive as well. The the, the new ones, and lot, lots that I've learned since I wrote the original. So yeah, yeah, really, really been I've been really enjoying that. But it's always really good as well seeing examples that people actually use and pick out. So <laughs> I'm always I'm always intrigued. Excellent. Um, and then we've got mental or written explain the mistakes in A, and then rank by difficulty in B. You happy with your choices? Yes, I'll stick with that, yeah. Excellent, and let me just stop share. I've got two guys who've rocked up outside. I think they've got some furniture for next door. And um, yeah, so sorry for springing, okay. <laughs> sorry for springing the tier list on you. Um, yeah, I should have thought to explain <laughs> what it is, but then I think you did a really good job at uh, yeah, notice. No <laughs> and so all, all that's left to do is say thank you very much for your time, Gareth. And, and hopefully this is the first of many, many chats that we get to have about maths. And, but I really appreciate your time. Yeah, I've really, really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me on, Kieran.